Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside the Burrow, the FAU podcast for and by fans, brought to you by FAUowlsnest.com. Uh, tonight we are uh, celebrating the, the biggest win uh, in FAU stadium history, where FAU demolished uh, North Texas 69 to 30 something. The score doesn't really matter. We broke many, uh, many and multiple records. And uh, tonight it's just me and Shane. Say what's up, Shane. What's going on, guys? Doing good. Uh, so yeah, uh, Jack's away doing something. I don't know where he is, but uh, we are uh, it's just us tonight, and we've got a, a good amount of talk, good amount to talk about. We're going to talk about North Texas, kind of the the bigger things. Yeah, we know the offense set records and stuff, but we'll talk a little bit about kind of some other key things that happened um, that are more probably more important for the rest of the year. Uh, we'll talk about uh, this week's opponent, Western Kentucky, and then uh, we'll definitely talk about. Uh, attendance, which was a big, uh, we throw some recruiting in there as well. Uh, attendance, which is a big thing on the board this year, so or this week, I should say. Um, so I guess to to get right into it, I mean, uh, you know, this this game was was really satisfying. I think there was some uh, there's some healthy banter uh, going on the board uh, this week, which is nice to be a part of it and uh, to see and, uh, this. I don't know if, if we really expected the this FAU team to show up this year, but um, you know it, it clicked. I think uh, the one of the biggest, my biggest takeaways, and and um, we'll get to Shane in this for, for his his view in a little bit. My biggest takeaway was uh, was definitely Driscoll. Driscoll played more than a game manager. He played like a solid uh, starting quarterback. We finally got to see him, you know, hit on a couple deep balls and made some some good decisions. So that was Driscoll was definitely a big thing for me. Yeah, Driscoll. Uh, what he does in the he's starting is he sets us off on offense so much as quickly as possible, which is the design of the offense. It's not complicated. I um, mean, you watch the highlights, you watch every play, you watch the games. Very simple offense. We're just going to line up faster than you can and, hand to, and get it to better athletes before you can get set. Uh, doing that is difficult. I and mean, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Uh, you know, there was a play that kind of explained our whole offense. Uh, I think it was late in the second half. There was a play where a receiver caught a ball a couple yards short of the third down. And I can't remember, uh, Dan, maybe help me with this, but he or he was ruled down. It seemed like North Texas wanted yeah. to challenge something like the spot or if he fumbled or if he had the catch and run the catch. And you know, we didn't even think about it. We just ran to the line, snapped the ball, and picked up two yards and got the first down. I mean, North Texas, their coaches couldn't even look at each other and be like, whether we uh, want to challenge this. And then after the fourth down play, I believe, uh, right after was another play where we, we picked up like 15 yards and got down the two and scored. I mean, North Texas was still thinking about the, whether they wanted to challenge the play, and we had to run three, two, three plays and scored on them. Uh, you know, that's why I just find it funny when, you know, everyone comes on. They're like, well, our defense has seen tempo. We've seen tempo. And it's, when a team executes tempo, you can't stop it. Unless yeah. you have uh, better athletes. That was – so, yeah, I, I remember the play. It was um, – yeah, they couldn't remember if he was ruled down, and the ball, like, it came out, and, like, une unexpectedly, nobody really jumped on it. Driscoll was right there, grabbed it, ran forward for, like, five yards, and was short for the fourth down, or for the first down, and then just, like, immediately was gone. had to play, and, and it was over. Like you said, they, they were – we we ran two plays, and they were still trying to think about um, – think I about remember they're gonna try my reaction to in the crowd. You know, normally I looked – to my friends and said, hey, should we, like, should we go for this? What are your quick thoughts? And then I'm going, oh, we're going for it. Oh, there's another play. Oh, we scored. Okay. You know, you yeah. know, get the sentence out and it's like, oh, you know, it's amazing when it's being executed and how much of this is improving week to week. Yeah. Is, I mean, if you look at the highlights sometimes, you know, when you're at the game, you can't get the full gist of it. There's a lot of other stuff going on, but they, they're fit. They were physically dominating. I mean, guys, Guys were not getting touched until they were well past the line of scrimmage. Yeah, and you brought up you brought up a good point. I, I wanted to mention this last week, but I forgot that like, you know, yeah, they said they played against tempo, they've seen tempo and stuff like that. But like, our offense, and and I'll sound I'll sound like a homer, and that you know some people might think this, but like, 
and and it's not just off our offense. I mean, if you look back, like the Chip Kelly years at Oregon when they got plays off super super quick, that's essentially we're we're basically doing the same thing. The defense can't get set, and in and and you mentioned this earlier in the year that our offense is kind of gimmicky. And yes, if we were doing this against top defenses, they'd probably shut it down. But Conference USA defenses cannot handle. Now that we're running it efficiently, they can't handle the speed and tempo that we can get plays off. But it, I think it, it, it has its design, you know, and I think it always offenses are gimmicky. And if just creating a gimmicky offense uh, scored points, Florida and Michigan would be doing it. But yeah. I think at the execution level, uh, and you know, we'll talk about in a second the talent we have. I would I would say we'd be able to score a comparable amount of points against most teams right now. Uh, yeah. You know, I I would take I, I would love to see in a game that I thought we were kind of in in the fourth quarter. I mean, we were driving um, and had a big play taken away Wisconsin down into the fourth quarter. If we were executing at this level at Wisconsin, would that be a game in the fourth quarter? I mean, yeah. they can't score. I mean, they, they they play a ten point game every week against anybody. I'm not, you know. Yeah. So maybe I don't know if we defend them any better, but I mean, is that that's probably a high scoring game in the fourth quarter? Yeah. Uh, and you know, we they were just a top twenty five team a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, it, I I want to mention though that it's not all this. We've recruited well. For years, and this is the frustration under Charlie Parks, where we just talk about oh, it's better. Uh, and everyone wants to talk to those. Oh, you know, we talked about this on last week's show, but those aren't the ones contributing and scoring all the points right now. Yeah, yeah there's a couple guys. You know, Franklin's getting some a couple scores in garbage time. McNeil's been kind of missing the last couple weeks. Yeah, uh, I think just because we're running the ball so well. Uh, Tulini's bit is a really nice addition on the D line, but all these guys that are making plays, the guys especially on defense that are making interception, Chris Tooley, Shelton Lewis, uh, you know, all, all these guys were here last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is it's finally all this top all this top tier, you know, Florida recruiting, it's paid off. And not only are we, are we probably the best coach team in the conference, we're definitely the most talented at this point. Yeah, that's Lane actually I was listening to the um to the after after the game coaches segment on uh, ESPN 1063, and uh, that was that was he actually made mention of that. He said Charlie Partridge recruited some really good kids, um, so we're we're at the point where we're finally seeing the talent that has been recruited turning it into something on the field. So that's been yeah, something there's, pretty there's good. There's an old adage: if you're a new coach going to a job, you want to follow the coach that recruited well and could it win. I mean, or Meyer. At Florida, <laughs> yeah, they were recruited, and they said, "Well, he said, here's all these guys." And it's like, okay, you just gotta go win with them now. You know, you, you don't want to follow the guy that didn't recruit well and couldn't win. <laughs> you know, that's FIU, so, uh, basically. Yeah, uh, you know, so you know, Butch, he has a little longer road, but it, it, when you can hand the ball, he averaged almost eight yards to carry. I mean, there was a stat put out today that he has. 24 touchdowns in his last 11 games. I mean, it's time he starts getting some national recognition. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was – yeah, that, I mean, that, that was the the offense is, is finally like – I'll now put our offense up against anybody anybody in the conference where before I was kind of kind of iffy. And I, I remember looking at like, you know, all right, well, we started well against um, the Thune. You know, that was kind of a blowout, but they're an FCS team. We beat – we beat MTSU. Yeah, we played well, but they're kind of down. You know, we kind of we really took it to ODU, but they're starting a, a freshman quarterback, 17 years old. Now I'm to the like I've convinced myself like we're the offense. Our offense is good. It's not that we're uh, the other defenses are so bad. Our offense is actually good. So uh, well, look, that's been pretty let's exciting. Not, let's let all the numbers let us forget how good the defense is playing right now. Uh, the 31 points is obviously, you know, uh, a bad number because, you know, we give up a bunch of late points in the fourth quarter you know, in backups. Uh, Guyton didn't have a single catch, and that's mm-hmm. all, you know, we heard about the whole week. And that's without our arguably best corner not playing, and you still shut down their best receiver. Yeah, it was – yeah, Guyton had, had no – um, no catches. Like he was targeted 
I can only think of a handful of times anyway. So he's not, not as if he was open to begin with. And then, um, you know, people, UNT fans on the board were saying uh, how great their running back was. I, for, I forgot his name, but he was leading Jeffrey Conference USA. Wilson. What's his name? Jeffrey Wilson. I mean, everyone's going to talk about, you know, how good the running back is. And then, yeah. And, and he had, had 49 yards. I mean, like, um, the, yeah, the, the, the two biggest things I got from the game is Driscoll playing well and the defense, like, the defense getting overshadowed because we put up a record number of yards, 803 or 804 or something like that. But, you know, the, the, defense, was, the defense was dominant. UNT, you know, 24 to nothing in the first quarter. Um, and, and like, like you said, they scored 14, 14 points in, in garbage, garbage time. Uh, I mean, we had walk-ons playing at that point. I mean, it was it, it, unbelievable. What I love, though, is uh, and if you read Lane's presser, I think it was on Monday, uh, one of his first comments, though, was uh, he wasn't happy about the points given up in garbage time. Uh, you know, you with Haven, running off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Him. You, know, you just win. You make these with in school history, and you want to, you know, you're talking about how North Texas's starters were able to sneak in a touchdown at the end versus our four stringers. But yeah. you know, that's the type of coaching we need, and that's you know what we didn't have before. Yeah. So that was that was that was big. That was big. Um. So before we we're, we're going to talk a little bit about recruiting and a little bit uh, about attendance, but before we do, we'll move on to to Western Kentucky, who uh, now I think their record they are five and one, six and one, um, five and two, five and two, three and one in the conference. Um, so this is this is certainly a big game, uh, certainly a big game for them. Again, kind of us basically a three way tie for the tops in FAU, Marshall, and Western Kentucky. Um, so it's at Western Kentucky, 4.30. It's on the stadium network, uh, that Twitter thing. I think that's where it's streaming. Yeah. yeah um, get through, like, I watch other events on it. It's, I mean, I, I, I know other people would say who don't go to as many games as I do, but it, it's a good stream. It, no, yeah. Um, yeah. A lot definitely. better than you. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's definitely. Um, so they are, you know, they're, I guess you could say they've lost, they've kind of lost the step. I mean, I think there's a couple of games they should have won. They probably would have under if they still had Jeff Brom, who's now at Purdue. Um, but they still have they still have a very talented uh, quarterback, talented receiver. Um, so they're still balanced. They still have the kind of recruits and kind of players that Jeff Brom uh, brought in. But I don't think they're quite as good. Uh, since Jeff Brom left, so I, I definitely think they're vulnerable, and I think Vegas thinks they're vulnerable as well because we opened as eight point favorites, I think. So um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on uh, on Western Kentucky and, and where you see us? The only chance Western Kentucky wins this game is if Mike White plays the absolute game of his career and throws something like six touchdown passes and we throw ball. Ten times. He gave up two, almost 300 yards of rushing to Old Dominion. So, uh, you know, last week, speaking with the other and then the D line this, oh, we shut down this guy, this. And it, West Kentucky can't even be like that. I know they're kind of banged up on their front seven. Uh, we might see what we saw, at least on the ground. Uh, yeah. West Kentucky's try and get us, you know, kill us with the short passes and possess the ball a little bit more. Uh, you might see teams try and do that even more and more now. Uh, you know, other Texas kind of runs up tempo and they're like, oh, maybe we can out up tempo them, and you can't. So we'll see. Uh, Mike Mike Sanford's their coach, and I think you know, they lost a lot in Brom. You know, Mike Sanford came from a four and eight Notre Dame team where he didn't really call plays, so I think he's kind of you know, learning on the job here. They almost lost at UTEP. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they struggled to beat Old Dominion. And I believe they were down uh, head points early in yeah. the fourth quarter to Old Dominion. So yeah. the team is struggling, but they do a lot better at home. They're a lot better at home. Uh, so 
but you know, I, I, the motivation should be clear for FAU. I mean, they just got to reshow that 52 to three uh, beating we took last year and we should double that. Honestly, I, I, I want to <laughs> wipe with them. I want them to become a basketball only school. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear about running up the score lane yeah. should on everybody. Uh, it, the scoreboard should look like a slot machine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a there. There's certainly that would be um, that would be some nice payback, uh, especially with us this this being the biggest game. Um, you know, again, we're we're gonna have to. Uh, Mike White is gonna have to gonna have to play well. North Texas again, their run defense is uh, run defense is suspect, which is which is fantastic. I mean, I don't think it doesn't matter who's running the ball um, at FAU, even Driscoll. And I, I love the package. I'd like to see John Franklin more and not garbage time. Um, I think if, I think the plays are there if need be, because he gives us a dimension that is, um, that, that we don't have with anybody else, which is, which is pretty exciting. Um, it, it's nice. Again, I said this last time, it's nice to be, to be watching competitive football, you know, in, at the end of October at this point, that that meaningful football for FAU. It's 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 just you know show how much has changed. I mean, we you know, a couple of weeks ago we were hoping to be eligible, then we get like another win, and we're like, okay, maybe seven wins, and now it's like, oh, we control our own destiny. The host that conference championship game. Uh, you don't get ahead of yourself, but you win these next two. Yeah. And, I mean, he finished the season with uh, right now an underachieving Louisiana Tech team, uh, FIU, who's not as close to being talented to us, and Charlotte. So you know these next two games are, but these are the ones that we just got, you know when we weren't as good. Uh, you know we've come close to beating Western Kentucky and played close games with them, and you know we know what's up next Friday night. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I think that's 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 something to keep in mind, and we'll kind of um, that kind of leads me to my next point, which uh, is a bit about attendance. And I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but there was a lot of people on the board, especially at the um, at uh, in the North Texas thread, uh, people kind of complaining, expressing their concern, and and I, I'm I'm kind of right there with them. I mean, uh, homecoming, even when we were three and nine, you know, we had two wins or something coming into homecoming was always more heavily attended. Um, I don't know kind of what changed. I, I mean, I, I'm on campus all the time, and it kind of felt as though homecoming wasn't quite as advertised as it normally is. Um, and I, I was a little surprised at the student turnout because I, I feel as though that's always that always boosts a little bit, even just for the first half. Um, but uh, I, I guess, I, I don't know, and I think... It's it's going to take a long time. If you look at any any school other than University of Florida or Florida State, they Which is not, even, not even true. I, I mean, it, I don't worry about as much attendance. I would have definitely more um, to go on Saturday, but maybe you kind of be in that 18, 17, 18 range, as opposed to where you know just under fourteen. Uh, but Florida fans have complained about it, especially student attendance, and them not coming in till second quarter. Uh, uh, wait till you see Florida State's attendance when they play noon games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a quote uh, this week uh, of Tom Herman, University of Texas, uh, saying that the student attendance needs to be higher. The student attendance at University of Texas, and granted it was an 11 a.m. game, but this is UT hosting number 10 Oklahoma State, and their student section, 10 minutes, it looked like they were right at kickoff, was a third full. So this is kind of a problem going on everywhere. I think, yeah. you know, this generation, people were flaky. I think, that obviously, the whole week, um, people were just talking about the chance of rain, which, you know, we've locked out, and there was like a 90% chance of rain going into this yeah. week. So, uh you know, I'm not, I'm, maybe that affects a few thousand fans, but, you know, I would say, remember, FAU's only had undergrads since 1988. Uh, you know, most, uh, the people I would say that have a college experience in FAU alumni-wise have only graduated in the last 10 years. 
so you know to, it's gonna take a while to get that going uh, definitely no i, I uh, and that was that was kind of you know kind of my point that um we're, we're, we're going to have this problem no matter what the the community will i think the community will support us i think it's going to take a lot of effort like if we beat western kentucky um and I'm I'm Pat Chun. I am throwing like every spare dollar at marketing. I'm like bussing high school kids in. Um, this, 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 I, I, this, here's this is where I disagree with you. I, I think FBU attendance wise has too much dependence on that. Everyone, especially on the home size with the Hyundai deck, you know, everyone had a bunch of you know maybe oh I came with a group of six. Uh, right. For the, like the Navy game, and then maybe last game their group was down to two or three. Are you that week of the games texting them saying, "Hey, you know, I know you've been to three or four FAU games with me over the last couple of years. Hey, it's a really big game this week. Do you want to go? Or are you just depending on FAU marketing for them to see a bus go by and be like, "Oh, I should go to the game this week." Nobody thinks that way. So no, I'm. But I think there's there's they need to do more than relying on fans to invite their friends yeah, i think fans we, play a big part of it yes i i think especially at the tennis level we're at i mean if we're talking about 13,000 people we have to do another 7,000 i can easily do with some of the I, cards just say that again I could, say that part again i couldn't hear you i said you know we're, we're not trying to fill a 90,000 seat stadium with all this crazy marketing it's you know we're trying to get from 13,000 to 20,000 so i think that's that's such an easy number if people just say, hey, you know, I'm definitely tailgating again this week. I remember we had a good time at the Navy game. Do you yeah. want to come? Yeah. You know, I can get you a ticket. Let me know. Oh, you can't go? I can get you a group. I can get a cool. You know, we have a good time. And it's just about kind of reaching out. You know, these people aren't going on the boards or not making an effort to check. Or, and, and if sometimes if marketing hitting them right in the face, you know, they're still not doing it. So it's kind of like this. People need to be invited to something personally. So, you know, if you have buddies and stuff that have gone to the games and stuff, uh, next Friday, uh, tell them to call out of work. Take a Friday off, half day, Monday. Games can be on CBS Sports. Marshall's in town. I mean, that's a big name. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, don't, yeah, you want, after you just throw a bunch of dollars on a few TV commercials and stuff, uh, I, I don't think that's what makes the difference. Well, I think it, well, it seems as if they're not doing much of any marketing um, now. And I think for that, you know, throw the marketing out there that says, you know, first place FAU team, conference championship, placing the conference championship game on the line, that type stuff will be. Um, I mean, it basically, I, I, I agree with you that if you have friends that do that, we shouldn't just rely. We need all forms of marketing, current fans. And uh, more than what FAU is doing right now to get more people in the stadium, because when you know when the community wants to, they'll show up, and we can have a decent sized crowd, a uh, decent sized crowd in the stadium. Yeah, I mean, even more important. I mean, in these games we've had these decent sized crowds, these huge sellout crowds, they haven't been good. So I mean, if you go like this past week in North Texas, you knew it was gonna be a good game. That's you know, that, that's the time to invite the two buddies that went to the Navy and the UM game and say, hey, you know, I'm tailgating again this week. Come on, get tickets. It's a good yeah. uh, uh, It's a big game. You know, your buddies that are Florida and Florida State fans, they're not going to, they, they, they should tell them not to watch. I had a buddy come down from, who was a Florida fan, you know, this week. And he's, you know, it's the most points he's seen all week or all year. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so, you know, it's a good time to be like, hey, you know, you, it just, you got to back. Uh, that you know, and an FAU draw another billboard to make the casual fan want to go to an FAU game. I, I think we have so too much dependency on that. You know, people people need to be personally personally invited. Yeah, no, I I, I would agree. I, I would agree. I just think that the overall, we there needs to be more um, more done by athletics. But um, yeah, and and so hopefully, yeah. Uh, even if we lose to Western Kentucky, we still have a chance um, to make it to the conference championship game if Western loses. But we'll um, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But uh, I know you we you wanted to, to talk a little bit about recruiting, um, and you know there hasn't really been much said 
And I don't, I kind of feel that's by design. I don't know. Yeah. I, I know someone brought it up on the board and it was even on the comment message board. And normally I'm a huge fan of this way. And right now, if you does not know how many scholarships it's going to have. Okay. At the end of the year, we don't have a ton. Uh, everyone knows how big our junior class is. The, the guys now that are seniors are, I think they're, there'd be Polini's last class and, you know, a lot of those kids didn't make it. So there's just not a ton of seniors right now. We're going to lose. Uh, I know since they know that, you know, they, I think they're just holding off taking commitments until it becomes serious. Uh, you know, they want to see who are maybe the little bigger names uh, floating out there and, you know, November, December, who they can probably go after. Uh, and be a little bit more picky this year. Also ride this momentum. So, you know, it, we're not getting the two-star kid right now and just taking his commitment early. Like, Western Kentucky's already, Western Kentucky's already stacked up 20 commitments. I promise you, the top two, three kids up floor are probably going to flip somewhere. Uh, and I, I don't think our staff just really wants to be a part of that. So, you know, and then I, definitely they're going to – I know it was tweeted about – uh, you know, Trickett was in the Mississippi, was in Mississippi during the bye week. There's you know, probably be a few more JUCOs that yeah. in, you know, the only position where I think, you know, we might need some JUCO help going into next year is we talked about some last, you know, probably interior line, you know, losing it to one who are both ran by pro football focus as two of the best players at Conference USA this week. So, uh, so you know, we'll probably need to fill in there. But I, I think Glane, you know, with the high school kids, can kind of wait and see and mm -hmm. see who some some decent size, you know, some really good recruits down here who can probably try and you know get at the end. And let's remember that you know Lane didn't start recruiting. We can hire Lane till December, Jan December you know, yeah, January. I mean, that coaching, that coaching search, the Lane search went on forever. He didn't get going. We were two weeks before the resigning re class. We were sixth in the conference. Yeah. So, you know, normally I, I panic about that stuff. And I know back when Schellenberger was, and we'd have one recruit during the season. <laughs> I yeah. that. But, you know, uh, Lane has a good track history of this. So uh, I, I'm not too concerned. They, trust me, we'll finish fine. No, I, I agree. And, and I think you, early on, you hit the nail on the head that no, this year – we had that kind of scare with the number of scholarships that we had awarded versus the number of commits we had, like even in the fall, they, you know, I don't know if they took scholarships away, it, it all worked out, but yeah, yeah they, they're going to keep it pretty close. Half of our original, even more, half of our original. Wait, no, say, say that one more time. You kind of cut out. Half of our original JUCO commits didn't even make it on campus. campus. Yeah. So Jesse Power, Rodney Washington, uh, I believe that, you know, there's a couple others who I can't think of off the top of my head. Another two that Javon Burris didn't make it on campus. The linebacker that was at Virginia Tech didn't make it on campus. So yeah. you know, that's where you get where your crew crew goes. But, you know, Lane and them were able to kind of – we didn't feel the pain as much because they were able to bring in other grad transfers that kind of like, okay, we lost one. Let's bring in another one. So, right. you know, I, I yeah. don't think the roster is more still looking to do that again this year. I mean, we – we bring back everybody. I mean, there's – Yeah. We want to start the next year. On the defensive line, we lose a couple guys. Yeah. I think in the back seven, they lose one. Uh, and then on the offensive line, you lose a couple guys and a couple of receivers who, you know, Solomon's the only one really playing right now. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. there's a lot of guys to be back. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So it should be should be exciting recruiting wise, uh, probably later on, uh, later on in the year than earlier like we've had in the past. But uh, so I think that about does it uh, for us. You know, big big win against uh, North Texas. Hopefully next week we can get Jack back and uh, you know Western Kentucky again our biggest our biggest conference game. Uh, if they keep winning, they keep getting bigger. So um, if, if anyone in the staff or just the miracle that anyone. And FAU listens to this, absolutely run it up on Western Kentucky. I, I want to be up 70 points, <laughs> and I want onside kicks followed by double flea flicker passes. <laughs> I want an outside the line store. I want 
controversy surrounding how much we run it up on this school. Yeah, hopefully and, so. Uh, hopefully so. Well, um, yeah, that does it. Uh, I guess that's going to do it for us. Make sure you check us out on Twitter at Inside the Borough. Email us, uh, Inside the Borough 1961 at gmail.com. Uh, always check out the board at Um And for Shane uh, and myself, thanks for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time. Go Owls. Thank you.